Okay. How you guys doing? Um, I guess a little bit about me. My name is Ryan Moore. I've been spearfishing pretty seriously since about 2004. Pretty much tried it and it took over my life. Um, I'm from the LA area and I've been a fathomier since I started diving. But uh, I moved down to San Diego here, I don't know, probably like eight years ago or so. And uh, I live down in South County. So, um, yeah, happy to be here with you all tonight. Thanks for having me. Um, I am going to talk about a couple things. Um, predominantly, I guess, will be kind of how to go about spearfishing traveling when you're going to maybe places that you've wanted to go to but you don't really know how to go about going there and getting a successful trip in and then uh, how to go about maybe kind of cultivating a good relationship with uh, a boat owner and you know I have never owned my own other than kayaks I've never owned my own boat and uh, there's been no shortage of really awesome dudes I've dove with that have awesome boats that are looking for guys to dive with um, and I mean, step one's coming to dive clubs and networking. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll dig right into it. So as far as the traveling thing, um, like anything, if you're going to do it right, it's going to take a lot of planning. Um, I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world and I started doing it with a handful of guys that, um, already knew what they were doing. And so it was kind of a like learning deal for me. Um, the best thing to do I'd say is, uh, you know, find out where you're going, first of all. First of all, what are you looking for? Or are you just going, like, is there a certain place you want to dive? Um, we have so much resources these days with the internet and Facebook and Instagram. You can see what guys are catching, you know, all over the world. And with just a little bit of searching, you can figure out, you know, kind of what areas certain people are diving. Um, so, so you basically find out where you want to go and then you kind of try to find out where you want to dive and then there's obviously endless logistics for how you're going to do it. Are you going to do the thing where you're like slumming it in the hostel or in going out, you know, diving with bongueros or are you going to do something where you're staying in a nicer hotel and you're going to go out on like a really nice charter every day? Um, these are all things that you can, you know, network with people in the spearfishing community with and find out what people have done before you. Um, and also, you know, looking online to see what's available in the area is a really good way to do it. Um, there's so many, like, I guess, spearfishing guides now in a lot of, like, especially popular locations like, you know, different parts of Baja and Puerto Vallarta or Costa Rica. There's, there's pretty much spearfishing guides set up just about everywhere you can go these days. Um, and most of the time they can take you to good spots. but. A lot of the time when you go with the spearfishing guide, you very well might be getting taken to the same place that everyone else is getting taken to. Um, so I highly recommend if you're going somewhere new, look at some charts. Like Navionics is a really good resource. It's an app you can get on your phone and you can download charts for anywhere in the world. And spearfishing, pretty much wherever you're at, fish are congregating around structure. So if you can learn what to look for, um, which, you know, joining a club like this and talking to people and doing the research will kind of tell you what that is. Pretty much fish are drawn to structure. So uh, if you can look at the charts and you can find out where the good structure is and you can kind of look at where the maybe the currents are moving and figure out where the water is moving, you can pretty much without very much intelligence figure out where the bigger fish are probably going to be hanging out. Um, and a lot of times it's good to do that before you go. So when you show up somewhere new, even if you do use some kind of a charter service, you can be like, hey, that's great. Like, let's go dive your spots. But also, like, I'm very curious to go check out this area I've been looking at um, and give it a go. Something that's worked out really well for me over the years, because I've been a pretty good handful of places where there aren't any kind of services, is uh, taking advantage of social media and communicating with the local divers. Spearfishing is internationally an extremely small, close-knit group. And you'd probably be really surprised to find out um, how many people are connected. I mean, just so, like, how, how is the best way to say this? I guess there's like not a whole lot of people maybe between like you and, yeah, a few degrees of like separation between you and these people you're trying to get in touch with that are the people that have the local knowledge and are willing to maybe take you out. Um, and overall, the spearfishing community is, is very welcoming all around the world. I mean, I was in Mozambique a couple years ago, and I was having a lot of trouble finding a boat that could take me out. And literally, like the day before I arrived to the uh, resort we were going to be staying at, I messaged this guy randomly on Facebook who was a local diver down there and was just an absolute hammer. I randomly, I think I searched like 
spearfishing Mozambique. And I found some of his videos and I sent him a message on Facebook and I was like, hey man, I'm from California. Uh, I'm a diver. I'm really interested in doing some spearfishing. And the guy ended up taking me out for like, you know, one of the coolest days of diving I've ever had. We dove a bunch of his awesome spots. We saw all kinds of fish and giant sharks. Um, and, and that exact same kind of situation has repeated itself over and over over my uh, diving career here, I guess. Um, so yeah, put yourself out there. Like reach out to these people. Um, you'd be surprised probably at how many of them would be willing to take you out. And uh, quite a few of them I've had even just come back here and visit and I end up taking out people from wherever, Australia or Africa or wherever when they come here and visit. Uh, it's a, like I said, internationally it's a really small community. Um, kind of circling back, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to go about these trips. You could spend a lot of money or like when I was first getting into it, we didn't have any money. So we were like slumming it super hard on a lot of our trips. We were sleeping on people's couches and floors and getting cheap pongas and just short diving when we had to. Like pretty much anything we can to put ourselves like in the positions where we could like hunt these new fish and these new places. Um, and another thing that really makes that work is having like a close knit like network or group of friends that are all kind of like minded or willing to travel and do these things. Um, it's a lot more difficult to do these kinds of things alone than it is with like a, a small group. Um, so that kind of brings me to the other side of this is, I guess the etiquette side of like how to get invited back when you're going on someone's boat. Um, there's a lot of little things you can do to make yourself stand out as a guest on someone's boat when you go diving with them. Um, and things to kind of consider that'll make you like, uh, I guess, uh, an easy choice when they're looking, when they're thinking again about who they're going to go out diving with next weekend, they'll think, oh, you know, I had John on my boat. John was awesome. So um, to kind of get into that, I guess a lot of it is just being like thoughtful and helpful and I guess going out of your way to like find a way to stand out, I guess. Um, so hopefully I don't bounce around too much. I'd kind of written down a bunch of ideas for things that I try to do. Um, first of all, like right away, right off the bat, so say uh, you talk to someone, you're going out on their boat the next day. Um, I highly recommend if you can offer to go out and get anything you can to help the day run smoother. Like, hey, do we need ice? Are we going to need food? Do you need me to go pick up, uh, you know, whatever. If he's going to fish too, me a chum or anything like that, small stuff like that, um, goes a long way to show that you're like not just dead weight on the boat. Um, I personally, if I can, I really like to bring something kind of unique for like lunch on the boat or something. Like I'll cook something the night before. Like uh, a lot of times I have like bluefin or white sea bass or something in the freezer. I'll cook it and make like a fish salad and plan to make like, you know, kind of do it yourself fish sandwiches on the boat. And, like bring some nice bread and good stuff. And um, that goes a long way to help you stand out. Um, once you're on the boat, I, everyone kind of does it differently. But when you show up, it really helps to have all your gear organized, to have your like dive bag all like very clean and not a bunch of random stuff that you're not going to need for the day. Um, nobody likes clutter on their boat. It helps to show up with a nice organized dive bag. All your gear is clean. Your wetsuit doesn't smell terrible. Um, you know, you don't bring 14 guns. You bring like one or two guns based on what you're going for. Um, it helps a lot to do a little bit of research on your own. If you can show up and be like, uh, you know, I was talking to some friends of mine and I know kind of where we're going and, you know, have some like recent dope or fish information to share with a group. That's super helpful. That makes you a more valuable part of the group there right off the bat. Yeah. Oh yeah. Showing up on time is extremely important. Uh, I've seen a lot of people get really upset at other people over the years because, you know, they wanted to get out of gray light and so-and-so is running 45 minutes behind and shows up and they're kind of like lackadaisical getting their gear on the boat. Uh, be early and you know be prompt about everything that helps a lot. Uh, once you're on the boat, being helpful and mindful goes a long way. Stuff like the lines and the fenders, like the guy who owns the boat is most likely driving the boat and realistically he doesn't need like other things to consider other than just like getting off the dock and getting the dander away. So if you're already grabbing fenders and putting lines away and asking him where things go, that makes you look really good. And a lot of this will probably seem like common sense, but it helps a lot. We, we all have a friend that's like the worst deckhand ever and everyone always like points it out. You just don't want to be that guy. Um, as far as like how the day goes, I highly recommend if you're on someone else's program, like, you know, contribute if they're asking like what we should do next, but very much be open to like their program. It's their boat and nobody likes someone who's like kind of pushy and telling you right away like, oh, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do this spot, you know, be, be understanding and, uh, 
it's the best way to get invited back. As far as, uh, yeah, weight belts is another thing. When you're getting on the boat, weight belts will scratch up a boat really bad and leave those like gray streaks all over the, all over the gel coat. It looks terrible. Boat owners hate that. Um, always ask where to put your weight belt. A lot of times they'll have a crate or a bucket where you can stow all your stuff. That's super helpful. Um, it always helps to like have a couple of your own spots that maybe the boat owner doesn't know about. Um, so if you know where you're going to be, like the general area, say you're going to Catalina or something, um, I mean, it's not a bad idea to take a look at Navionics like I talked about earlier and be like, oh, you know, there's a high spot over here, a rock slide over here they might not know about. Um, that just adds more value to you coming on their boat. Um, spear guns, when you're in the water, with the tuna hunting we've been doing the last couple of years, it's very common for people to leave their guns loaded and put them on the boat. I know that's super unsafe and I would never recommend that. Um, so always unload your spear gun when you're getting on someone's boat. Some guys insist on leaving the guns loaded just because they're getting in and out so much. Um, always assume that you should unload the gun before getting on the boat. Uh, knowing the regulations wherever you're diving is super helpful and uh, a necessity really. Um, I've heard of horror stories of guys taking other guys out and they're at like Santa Barbara Island and like this new guy they don't know shoots a black sea bass or something. And it's just an absolute nightmare with like other boats around and it's just like the worst possible situation. So don't do that. Know the rules. Know DFGs. Uh, know what's in season and what isn't. Um, when you're getting in the water in the beginning of the day, I like to at least, you know, some boat owners don't care. I've been on boats with guys that are maybe a little older and they're like real slow to get in the water. I always insist that the guy whose boat it is, you know, gets in before me. Let them get in the water. Let them work. If they want to work up current, let them work up current. If they want to work, you know, left in the kelp bed, let them go left in the kelp bed. Kind of, I guess, don't crowd them. You know, let them do what they want to do and kind of just be respectful in that respect. Oh, this is a really big thing for a lot of us. Um, and especially if you guys have taken any of the free diving classes, um, being a really good spotter diver is a huge important part of this whole spearfishing thing and you'd probably, well, you might not be, but there's a lot of people that don't quite understand what that means. If you get in the water and you're diving with someone, whether there's a fish on or whether you're just diving, um, the whole one up, one down safety style of diving is really essential, I mean, to make this a safe sport and also just to be more effective. I mean, you see so much more when you're working in a group like that. Um, it makes you look really good when you get on someone's boat and you say, hey, you know, let's dive together, let's stick together. And you actually do it rather than getting distracted and swimming off. I mean, I don't know how many times I've gone out diving with guys and I've been like, hey, I'm going to punch a deep dive here. Like, can you watch me? And they're like, yep, absolutely. And then you come up and you just see they're like 50 yards away swimming the other direction. Um, definitely not something to do if you're trying to make a good impression on someone's boat. So. Um, don't be selfish. Spend the time it takes to like watch that diver and work together and you guys will see more fish because of it. Um, I mean, I, I definitely can attribute a lot of my successes in spearfishing to diving with guys that were, you know, we worked well together and because of that we put more fish on the boat and we're still here today. Oh yeah, don't blow off instructions. Like if they're, if the boat owner tells you to do something, you should do everything in your power to do it, whether that's like, um, they ask you to not put your gear in a certain place, or they ask you to um, basically whatever it is. It's their boat, and it's a, you know again a sign of respect for you to listen to them and follow their orders. Um, don't flake. If you decide you're going diving with someone, like I understand emergencies come up, but if you just last minute decide that you would rather be doing you know go to the farmer's market with your girlfriend rather than go out diving. Don't call the guy that morning and be like, I can't make it. I mean, you should make every effort in the world to get there and be there on time. Um, another thing is if you're kind of like getting into diving with a group of people, I find that like the guys that when they answer, when they get called to go diving and they're consistently like canceling or saying they can't go, like those are the guys that end up eventually not getting calls to go. So. I, I have a horrible schedule, it's always busy, and I totally get that, but like, if, uh, like, say somebody you really want to dive with is calling you to dive, like, by the second or third time, I would highly recommend doing everything in your power to, to make it and get there, that way you're not just, you know, off the list. You know, be really vigilant when the boat's underway, um, this kind of just comes from my background as a professional mariner, but if you see something that doesn't look right, or you smell something that smells like fuel, or just something doesn't seem right, you see 
a boat crossing in front of this guy driving, always say something. I mean, there, it's really easy for things to go wrong out there. And a lot of times, you'll see things maybe that not everyone has seen yet. Um, and identifying small things, like I said, whether it's a crossing vessel or something in the water you're about to run over, or I've heard some horror stories about fuel leaks on boats and fires and explosions. And um, you smell something weird, or you hear a bilge pump running and it's maybe not supposed to be, or the boat seems like it's listing over in a way it's not supposed to. These are all things that, if they don't seem right, they probably aren't right. And you should at least say something so that the guy that knows the, vet, the vessel a lot better than you can uh, address it. That'll uh, make you stand out. Probably the most important, because I've seen this a million times, is uh, at the end of the day, ask them what you owe them. And whatever that is, if you can afford it, give them a little bit more, because running a boat is not cheap. It is extremely expensive, and everything's always breaking. And uh, the guys that show up and are respectful and useful and fun to hunt with, that's another really big thing, just being fun. I mean, if you get on the boat and you're all poopy pants and you're a frown on your face the whole time, <laughs> nobody's going to want to dive with you in the future. You know, tell some jokes, like be loose, like have fun, but be flexible and willing to do what they want to make the day work right. Um, don't be selfish, and uh, at the end of the day, pay the guy what you owe him. Um, I've seen that a million times where like guys are just cheap and they just don't pay their fair share, or they just kind of like, I guess, edge around like that question of like, hey man, like what do I owe you? What can I do to like make my contribution to like justify your day and all this work you put into the boat? Um, don't be that guy. You won't get invited back. Nobody wants to die with that guy. Um, is there any questions? Yeah. Nate. What do you do if you're a person that gets sick? Oh, seasick. So there's a couple things you can do. Um, and there's different types of seasickness. And people always ask me, because I work on boats, like, do you get seasick? And the truth is, everyone gets seasick eventually. It just depends on the conditions. And uh, there's a lot of factors that can kind of add into that. But I, the best option for most people is to take the non-drowsy mescaline, I think it is. Is that what it is? The uh, Dramamine? Oh, Dramamine. Non-mescaline. Non-mescaline. Sorry. No, non-mescaline. What's the, there's another, there's another drug that sounds like that. Anyways, the, the non-drowsy Dramamine is the one that most people take. You can get it over the counter and it, uh, yeah, I forget, but there's another drug they use for that at work. It sounds like that. Meclizine. That's it. Yeah, okay. I don't know my drugs very well, apparently. Don't mix those up, I guess. Um, yeah, but non-drowsy Benadryl works really good. I mean, some people wear those little, like, they're like a wrist guard with, like, a button that, like, puts pressure on your wrist and somehow helps. There's a lot of science to support that ingesting ginger, which is why they used to give ginger snaps on planes, um, because it supposedly helped with motion sickness. Eating ginger helps a lot, and this is kind of a side note, but I like it. If you're diving for sea bass or rockfish or somewhere, thing, really, somewhere really cold, I like to bring a, uh, like a thermos of like really strong uh, ginger herbal tea because there's like also a lot of science that says that ginger can help raise your, blood to your body temperature. So it keeps you warmer, warms you up. I don't know if it actually works, but at least it, you know, it tastes good and it's really warming, kind of like cuts the cold a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's what I would do is non-drowsy Dramamine is the best option probably. For some people, eating something actually helps a little bit, but I don't know. Being hungover does not help, I can tell you that. Yeah, I mean, being on, out on deck in like the wind and where you can see the horizon helps a lot. Like if you get seasick and you go down in the cabin or something and you're trying to like do pretty much anything where you're looking down, you're going to get sick. There's like pretty much no way around that. You're probably going to throw up and have a terrible time and potentially ruin the day for everyone. It sucks. Definitely don't forget your fishing license. That's a big one too. I'm still surprised that California requires you to have a printed copy. I'm surprised you can't just have like a saved file on your phone. Um, but yeah, that's still the rule. Yes. Yeah. No, if you, if you break something on someone's boat or even if like, say you put a spear tip through a piece of upholstery or you, whatever, you weight belt cracks the cowling on the engine or something like that, I mean, definitely don't ignore that kind of thing. You're way better off to own it and like, take responsibility and see if you can like financially help compensate them for that or if there's something you can do to help fix it. I mean, stuff's going to break. That's just the reality of being out on a boat, but don't uh, don't try to weasel your way out of it. That looks really bad. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean asking asking what you can do when you're standing idly goes a really long way. Um, cuz you know, guys have very specific ways they have their rigs set up and how they like to launch their boat and retrieve their boat and get out of the harbor and come back to the dock. Um, all that is stuff that, you know, you, just you asking makes you stand out rather than you just being a worthless lump of clay on deck not doing anything. Share, share I see. Yeah, definitely, definitely sharing your catch goes a long way for sure. If it's, 
if it's possible, I mean, if you guys get back at 11 o'clock at night, you might not want to cut up a bunch of bluefin right then. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like sharing the catch goes a long way. I mean, what I really like to do, and this applies, you know, at the boat when people give you fish, or even when guys just like you know hook you up and they got back in Baja and they give you a couple pieces of cabrilla. I mean, when you cook them and do something cool with them, I always like to send the guy who got it from a picture. So they're like, oh yeah, this didn't just rot in this dude's freezer for five years and then he threw it away. Like, he enjoyed it, and it makes them like, not only do they feel good about sharing, but they're more likely to give you something cool in the future. Yes, that was on my list somewhere in there too. Yeah, if somebody takes you to spots that you that are their spots, you know, somewhere you've never been, don't take the next guy that takes you out on his boat to that spot. That is a super bad look. And there's been so much drama over the years throughout all the spearfishing clubs about so and so brought so and so to so and so's spot. And now everyone's going to the spot. And now so and these two guys don't talk anymore. I mean, guys will lose their minds over this because I mean. It could take you know years and years of searching to find good spots, or, or longer. Um, and so yeah, not, not burning people like that, it really makes a big difference. Yeah, anything else? Anyone else have any good tips for uh, going out diving with people? Get good at filleting. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Get good at filleting, but maybe be safe about it too. We had, we had one trip, it was a ripe team trip a couple years back, and we just loaded up on mahis and yellowtail on the patties. And we came back and the guy whose boat we were on, he hadn't really thought it through, I guess. He didn't really have a good place for us to flay any of these things. And we had like a bag just packed. And so we pulled into Newport Harbor and there's like a little fish market in the back bay. Um, it's like on a little barge. And so we're like, well, maybe they'll either cut our fish for us or let us cut our fish there. And we pulled in, there was some young kid, like 17 year old kid running the shop and he was like, yeah, absolutely, guys. I can't cut your fish, but um, you guys are more than welcome to cut them here. I'll give you bags and ice and everything. It was awesome. So we worked our way through this bag. We cut like all these fish, and there was one left. And the kid that worked there was watching, and uh, he was commenting on like how we were flaying. And I asked him, like, hey, man, you've cut you know, thousands of pounds of fish. You cut fish every single day here. You know, and I'd be really interesting, interested to see how you cut fish, you know, as opposed to how we've been cutting fish. And he was like, yeah, absolutely, no problem. So this kid, you know, super nice guy, I still talk to him today, jumps down on the boat, and we're flaying, uh, it's a center console, and we're on the back there on top of the trans, and we have a cutting board laid out and a bunch of real sharp knives. And he starts making his first cut, and this yellowtail slide, starts to slide off the cutting board, and he goes to grab it, and he taps the inside of his wrist with a fillet knife. And we all, like, freeze. Again, like for like a split second, and like we're thinking, like, oh my god, that was so close. And then he just starts squirting blood. He got his, uh, he got his radial artery. And uh, so yeah, cutting fish is really important and really good, but uh, be really careful about it. And uh, I mean, that'll that'll change the tide of an afternoon there pretty quickly. Start squirting blood everywhere. Yeah, there's a yeah. I mean, that is definitely. Not advisable to tell them that your other friend doesn't make you pay for gas. <laughs> you will not get invited back, I promise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, be flexible. Um, like, there's that fine line probably between, and it depends on the person too, between suggesting something, like a better way to do something, and kind of stepping on someone's toes when it's kind of just how they run things. Um, you're in their, you know, in their space really when you're on their boat. And so, yeah, you just have to kind of go with the flow and be willing to uh, make adjustments. Yeah. Weight distribution, especially on smaller boats. Yes, weight distribution is huge. Especially like if you notice something like like you're standing on the, you know, stern of the boat and you guys just can't get up on plane, go to the bow. Like yeah. or you know, if all the weight belt boxes are on the port side and you guys are listing over really hard to port, like maybe try to find a way to move a couple of them like, you know, over to the starboard side and balance you guys out. Yeah, those are small things, but they uh, again make you seem like you're not just completely useless. I've been on some boats where we've been assisted by Coast Guard. Um, when you're out on the water, it's always fun. Most of the time, it's always fun. And then every once in a while, stuff goes down and things change really fast. Uh, I've been on boats that have been taken on water. Uh, I've been on boats where we we hit a whale and our outdrive broke and we had to get towed in and we're really lucky that boat didn't go down. Um, my biggest piece of advice, and it's in line with everything that Ryan just said, is just be cognizant of what's going on, be mindful, be aware, and be adaptable. Um, sometimes people will get injured, whether it's a cut with a knife 
or sometimes they'll have like a diving accident, they'll get like a squeeze or something like that. Um, pay attention. You can't plan for every scenario, but you can uh, think through most scenarios and then with the training that you have, it's the same conversation with like free dive classes, right? Like it's not gonna save you, but it'll help inform your decision making and you'll make better decisions. Um, so when it comes to boats and things, like yeah, it's, it's all about making good decisions, working together as a team, and then when, we, when it comes to offshore diving and fishing, uh, with kelp patties, I always like to establish a rotation. Uh, if somebody's never shot a fish, like a yellowtail or a mahi-mahi before, I always try and put them in first. I'll put them in until they shoot a fish. Uh, when it comes to bluefin, you know, usually you have your team. Ryan's got way more experience with this than me, but uh, when I shot the one fish I've shot, uh, I had to talk to the guys on the boat and say, guys, like, the captain needs to drive the boat. I need to be the diver, but you need to help me with the line, and the other guy needs to help me with the gun, and the other guy needs to help like find the fish. Like, the guy shooting the fish has the easiest job on the boat. Everybody else has to work together as a team. Whether it's you know setting anchor for diving sea bass or like trying to find a kelp paddy. Like, it's all team effort, and that's why having those friendships and the relationships in this club, where you get to trust people and get comfortable diving with them, makes these experiences so much better. Um, there's nothing worse than like being out on the water and having disagreements with people and, and it ruins the day. When everybody's in sync, everybody's cruising together, like some of the best days I've ever had. Absolutely best days I've ever had. Um, and then the last thing I was gonna say is uh, when we're out there, we're, we're encountering a lot of fishermen rod and reel. Um, a lot of those guys hate divers. Quite frankly, they hate divers. They see spear guns, they see wetsuits. They go, these freaking people, these people, they jump in on the kelp, they shoot two fish, and they leave, and it's done. Um, if you're fishing rod and reel, if you've been offshore and been on a sport boat and pulled up to a kelp paddy that had, like, 200, 300 yellowtail on it, you can pull 200 yellowtail off a of kelp rod and reel. Um, you know, ethics aside, like, it's very efficient. It's a really good way to catch fish. Um, I like spearfishing better, personally, when it comes to kelp patties, but uh, when you roll up to a kelp and if somebody's fishing it, either go find another one, because you're likely in a zone that has kelp patties, or call them on the radio and be polite. Um, I've had many times, actually Mike and I, we were talking about this earlier, had a really good time where we found, uh, we actually had a spotter plane help us find some kelps, and then we ended up encountering the guy who had hired the spotter plane, and we fished it with him, and then they let us jump in. And it was all because Mike happened to know the guy, but we were just polite on the radio. Um, they said, you guys better not jump in and shoot fish. We said, no, 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 we're fishing first. And then after they did several drifts and we're done, we said, all right, jump in and, and kill everything, please. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it can be really fun. Um, it usually is, but it just takes a little bit of planning, some mindfulness, and then... Um, yeah, being adaptive and recognizing like some of the questions we're saying like, you know, everybody's gonna have a different program like become part of the team Whether you're the team leader or the first cat or like first uh, First mate or whatever your role is on that boat do it to the best of your ability because The way you get the experience to know how to drive the trailer backwards or how to tie up the boat or how to get the Engine to start when it's not turning over is just having experience doing that like Three years ago, I knew very little about boats, and now I like work on boats. So, try and get more experiences. The best way to do it is to just be gracious and be kind.